What made Manu Ginobili so special? How responsible was he for the Spurs' culture? Will his legacy last? The only question left is, say it with me, you win. Hey sports fans, Coach Nick here and welcome to the B-Ball Breakdown Podcast. And today I am very pleased to bring on friend of the breakdown, or perhaps even best friend of the breakdown, Mo Doc Hill, who uh, has come on the show quite a bit, and we all know him as a former video coordinator in the NBA, and also the founder of thejumpball.net, something you should definitely check out. But he also has a particular resonance with what we're going to talk about today, which was the retirement of Manu Ginobili, because Mo was a video coordinator for the Spurs uh, in 2009 through 2011. Uh, did I get that right, Mo? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. And thanks for having me, Coach Nick. Hey, my pleasure. So we have somebody who was around the team and got to watch Manu uh, in his prime, which sounds really exciting to me. Now, I guess maybe it was a tail end of his prime, but certainly uh, you got you got everything at the top of his powers, right? Yeah, no, I got to I got to watch some Manu stuff. I mean, funny thing to just start it off, you know, first game of the year is the it. My first game in San Antonio is the game where Manu swats the bat out of midair. Oh, wow. wow. You, you know, so it's <laughs> like, you know, just kind of started the season with that. And I was just like, oh, <laughs> what's this guy doing? What What was the reaction from the teammates like after the game from that? Everybody's everybody was just kind of like, well, you know, if anybody's going to do it, it's going to be Manu. Like only Manu is going to be able to swat this bat out of midair. Um, I think Pop had the greatest line, I think, to reporters. He just kind of said, and the legend of Manu continues to grow. Like, <laughs> just just add that to it. But, you know, the funny side part of the story, which doesn't get talked about too much, is that the bat didn't die. Like, the bat actually lived, but it flew away so that we were never able to actually do a, a rabies test. And that they actually had to give Manu shots once a month for, for rabies. Oh, wow. And, 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 and to obviously prevent him from getting developing rabies. And it wasn't like an easy – it's like a shot in the stomach or something like that. It was like he, he started the season relatively slow, and, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if part of it was because of these rabies shots. Yikes, yikes. Because uh, right, So did the bat ultimately – like it did bite him? Is that the deal? Or, we, or they scratched him or we don't know? We, we didn't know, and it was just a matter of, of precautions. You know, yeah, if you, right. I guess if you, if you handle a bat, you need to uh, – if for anybody out there, <laughs> go get tested for rabies. Yeah. Um, and you need the bat to test if it has rabies. So when the bat flew away, it was just kind of like nobody thought about it in the moment. It was right. kind of a team doctor kind of just going like, hey, um, we, uh, <laughs> we we should probably do this. Yeah, right. Well, let's let's talk about your role as a video coordinator there, because, you know, we hear a lot about players nowadays who, you know, really study film and get into analytics and all that kind of stuff. And it's kind of I'm kind of curious if Manu was that kind of guy who really wanted to study a lot of film or because to me, he feels a lot more like organic and, and instinctual. But uh, what kind of preparation did he do? You know, Manu kind of just did the regular preparation that everybody else did. And, and granted, when I was there, it's it's important to kind of note because it's it's easier now for players to digest film because iPads are so regular. When I was there, the iPad was like a brand new thing, you know, and it wasn't <laughs> as 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 common. So really spreading film around wasn't necessarily as easy. It was putting it on a DVD and giving it to guys, um, you know, or, 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 or showing stuff on the computer. So it wasn't even as portable as it is now now it's much easier so i don't know how much in the later years if he's gotten got more into it but you know manu was always watching games in general on on off nights you know obviously paid attention in our film sessions always studied the scouting reports and knew what was going on in that regard and these guys you know when you've been around the league as long as these guys have you you tend to know most of the players who you're playing against so there, there there was definitely a a level of it but like i was there right when this stuff was barely even about to begin you know kind of pop off so yeah we we have you know on the the um nba on the tnt their uh their post game show with uh barkley is uh certainly well documented how he would scream ginobili's last name uh never do that for anybody else by the way like that <laughs> never his play never doesn't you know no one else's play ever elicited that kind of response and i was kind of curious if you could put to words what about his play gets people to just scream his name <laughs> out loud like that 
It's true. Like Manu is the kind of player like he, you don't necessarily expect it. Then he pulls something off, and you're just like, "Holy crap! How did he do this?" or or whatnot. And 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 part of it is the the awkwardness of a lefty and how you know he he kind of moved in a certain way that was interesting. His ability to pass is is something that kind of catches your eye. Um, I was talking about it on on Twitter the other day of a of a pass. I thought it was against the Pistons, but it was against the Lakers, where the ball kind of got swung to him. And Manu catches it with one hand and just rockets it right underneath the basket to Matt Bonner for a layup, you know. And it's just kind of, you know, to me that's a that's a get off your seat pass. You know, I saw it and was just kind of like, oh wow, um, you know. And 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 that's just kind of, he just has an an electric feel to it, you know. Like when Manu has the ball, you're gonna pay attention. There's an electric feel to because he's done it so many times with so many amazing ways where you're like. How did he pull that shot off or, or, or anything like that? There, that's the thing about Manu. It's just kind of a, almost an artist at work, you know, and you don't know what you're going to get sometimes. You just, you know, sometimes it's terrible uh, <laughs> and a turnover. Um, but other times it's magical and you're just like, oh, wow. And right. he just kind of he, he's just electric in that way, in the way he plays and, and the way he moves and everything. It's, 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 it's going to be sad to not watch him this year. Yeah, it's like it's visceral. It's almost like breathtaking. It literally breathtaking where as it's unfolding and, you know, you can he's already two beats ahead of everybody else anyway. So you're like just trying to catch up to what's happening. And he's already firing a, you know, a, a, a baseball pass under the basket for the layup after getting a steal out of nowhere um, or a, an, a, or a behind the back pass off a pick and roll right into the guy's hands or or making the shot. Certainly, the, you know, if you go through his top 10 plays on you know the YouTube side, you'll see a ton of dunks, which had to must have engendered him to a lot of like the quote unquote athletes in the NBA who would have looked at him and must have like nodded their head and been like, yeah, that, that, there's something there. I think, you know, in his later years, we've forgotten a little bit of that, but um, certainly he had hops. Yeah, you know, he, he definitely did. And, you know, the other thing, too, is he's, you know, he's hit a lot of clutch shots in his career. He's hit a lot of game winners. Um, the the other thing that, that, that he's really most known for is, you know, he's not the one who brought the uh, the Euro step to the NBA, but he is the guy who kind of perfected it. Oh, you know? well, who are we going to say brought it to the NBA? I, I always thought it was uh, Sarunas Marshallonis. Oh, yeah, you're right. Sorry, forgot uh, about him. But, but, but Manu has perfected it in a way that you, you, you he made it his own it's a very very fluid the way he moves it's this is gonna sound a little bit weird but it's kind of like he's like water he'll just find a way he'll fit <laughs> through any container he'll he'll um you, you know he'll squeeze through stuff where you're like i didn't even know there was space you because i have clips of him as i'm watch as i'm talking to you yeah and, and i'm watching and he's just squeezing through stuff and and and, and narrowing get narrowly getting by guys and stuff like it's just a, a man who just kind of has that weird ability to contort his body i mean he's he's one of the most flexible human beings i've ever seen um i think one day coming out of shoot around or, or a practice and Manu's getting ready and he's he kind of has He's not doing the splits, but like he's stretching his hips in a way where I just kind of look at him and going like, pretty sure I would break everything in my hips if I tried that. Like yeah. that, humans aren't supposed to be able to do that, but he has this kind of almost elastic ability. Well, I think what transcended the Euro step for him was that he can change the timing of it, where he would slow down the first step a little bit and wait and then cross over with the other, or even a regular layup, he would do that, or the reg uh, sort of inline layup, but like a mix between a regular and a Euro, where you're not quite changing directions, but it was so sort of stop-go, herky-jerky, um, and it always served to throw the defense off balance. And then, boom, there he is rising up under control. You know, that's the thing is he kind of feels like he's a little bit out of control, a little bit off balance. But he would always end up just appearing in the air, nicely aligned, you know, soft touch, you yeah. know, open. <laughs> that's the key. He'd emerge, right? And all of a sudden, there's just no hands around him. And he's just <laughs> banking it softly off the backboard. Really just, um, you know, I, I, I think it goes without saying we're just we're never going to have another player like him. No, I mean we're just not. I, I I don't think it's possible, um, you know, to have that combination of skills and and also to be that selfless. You know, I mean, he came off the bench his whole career um, in in San Antonio, and this is coming from he's coming from Europe where he's a star in Europe. You know, when he when he, when he kind of made his way to San Antonio, um, and and uh, it not just only you, you understand starting out. Okay, I'm going to start out off the bench. 
never once wanted to start, you know, I mean, of course, probably wanted to start, but never once really kind of talked about it, never made a, a bones about it. Again, just going to do whatever the team needs. And if, and if they told him, Hey, this is the best thing we think to help you and, and help the team, Manu's all in and, and, and you never heard a peep about it. And, and that's kind of something we don't see nowadays from guys, um, you know, who, who, who kind of have that understanding, um, of like, Hey, no, I, sh- I should come off the, uh, the the bench and and stuff like that and for him it wasn't about coming off the bench it was about ending games and and like I said he's done that before plenty of times and you needed him out there at the end of games even recently he was out there at the end of the games doing his ISO thing for the Spurs and the only real difference was that his thick head of hair had been reduced to a shaved head to hide his baldness you don't have to follow this path if you get to it in time you can maintain your hairline and avoid the bald spot in the back by going to forhims.com, a one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness for men. Hims connects you with real doctors and medical grade solutions to treat hair loss, and you can avoid that embarrassing line of questioning in the doctor's office when they wonder why you're even there. Trust me, I've been in this situation, and I'd much rather do this online. It's so easy, just answer a few quick questions and their doctors will write the prescription and have everything shipped directly to your door. And if you order now, you'll get a trial month of hymns for just 5 bucks while supplies last. See website for full details. This would cost hundreds if you went to the doctor or a pharmacy. Go to forhims.com slash coachnick. That's F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash coachnick. And don't let what happened to Manu happen to you. Yeah, and I think if you needed any evidence of what you're talking about, about starting and how players feel, you know, C.J. McCollum had Kevin Durant on his show, on his podcast, Friend of the Breakdown, C.J. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, but he was, he was kind of belligerent about, like, not, never wanting to come off the bench. And, um, you know, it, it probably is indicative of what, what most players feel. And then, but Kevin Durant tried to explain to him, hey, man, like, if you're on a winning team, that's what you got to do. And then if you're finishing the game, who cares? Like, he had all those other, you know, the coachy answers. Right. Um, but I suppose that there are certain, you know, that, that certain players who just won't listen to that. And, uh, yeah, you always have the sense that, that Manu couldn't care less about any kind of stat. And I think, you know, we've seen a little bit of uh, grumbling on Twitter about like, oh, look at his numbers. Like, is he really a Hall of Fame guy or something like that? And um, it's just so um, what's the word I'm looking for? Cynical or whatever that is that you just you'd go to that or or just ignorant, I suppose, of what he was. Is it is it possible that there's a significant amount of people on Twitter that just weren't even old enough to remember him in 2006? Probably. I think so. I think so. I mean, there's, there's a good amount of people, I think, who don't understand his importance to that team, you know, they listen, they don't win all their championships without Manu. It's not a, a you know, they, they would have been fine without him kind of situation. He was clutch. He came up big. He did everything the team needed. He could have averaged all the numbers you wanted him to, mm-hmm. you know, but the thing was he sacrificed his game to, to make sure that he could get there. Now, do, I don't think he's better than Tim Duncan or anything like that. I don't want anybody to come back saying that, but I'm saying is, you know, he allowed all these guys to be those things. And those guys, Tim, Tony, you know, Coach Pop, will all talk about how they don't win if it wasn't for Manu, you know. And, and you know, it's, it's one of those things. We were talking before the call, like, he easily could have won the finals MVP in, in 2005, I think, or, or 06, when they beat the Pistons. You know, uh, I, I think it went to somebody – it definitely went to somebody else. I just don't remember who at the current moment. But, you know, he, he's he's one of those guys that, like, he just finds ways – to make plays happen and make, you know, wins. And and you need that. And it's not always going to translate in numbers. This is why guys who always just stick to the numbers is their their argument. To me, it's, it's, it's a flawed argument because not everything shows up in numbers. You don't see everything that he can do and provide for the team. Right. And in that 2005 finals, Tim Duncan did win uh, the MVP with, uh, you know, his numbers were 20.6 points, 14 rebounds. And uh, it says 2.1 without even specifying what that is. Thank you, uh, B-Ball Ref. But it's probably <laughs> 2.1. It's not I don't think he blocked 2.1 shots in the, per game, did he? It's probably it's got to be assists, right? Uh, probably. Yeah. Yeah. So although anyway, Mon, you, you never know. <laughs> although. Uh, oh, actually, here we go. Yeah, it's assists. My fault. But oh, you know what? He actually did also uh, average 2.1 blocks. 
So uh, in the, in that seven game series, you know, I really lament. I was mentioning this before. Uh, for some reason, I, the NBA went dark for me after around 2004, and I missed a lot of NBA from 2005 to about 2009. And uh, I really am upset now because like, there's a seven game series between them and the Pistons, which was great. Um, and and then all the Suns stuff, the seven seconds or less was happening. So. Uh, I need to kind of re-educate. And you know what? Maybe I'll just, maybe I'll will do the video. If you haven't seen the video I did about a year and a half ago for, to honor Manu, uh, it's really good. You should go check it out um, on YouTube on my channel. But uh, I think I might need to do another one. It's been maybe more of a full career retrospective. Uh, Mo, what would you think would be some real key moments I got to make sure I cover if I'm doing a video on him? Yeah, I mean, I think you got to start out, you know, not just – not in the NBA. I think you got to start out with his European career and what what he's he's done over there. Um, well documented there. I think you have to talk about you know his, the Argentina national team. You know they're they're really since since the the NBA teams became were able to play and stuff like that. They were the team that won the gold medal that forced us to have the redeem team. You know uh, in the Olympics. You know the the Argentinian golden age where it was him. Nocioni, uh, uh, Oberto, um, I'm sure I'm forgetting a bunch of other guys. Oh. Having all those guys in a typically soccer na- heavy nation, you know, all these guys, you know, NBA players, you know, kind of show up and, and, and really help them win a, uh, a, a gold medal is, is, is huge, you know, and, and was, was unexpected at the time, you know. Um, so I think you kind of, you have to include that stuff. And then, of course, his NBA career, I think you go, you can go everywhere from, you know, his passing to his shooting to his defense. You know, Manu had an incredible skill to kind of just sort of time defensively when to just be right there for a steal. You know, a guy has the ball at the high post and just as he's as he's about to turn and, and, and make a dribble, Manu's right there stealing, the, snatching the ball out of his hands. You know, it, it, it's it's just it, it's really crazy the ability he had in that sense. And it's just, I don't even have words to really describe it, you know? Um, well, that's the thing is, can't you, like, that's the kind of thing you probably can't teach from a coaching standpoint, right? There's always that guy, or not, man, not always, you're lucky to have him, right? Who's just a little bit, he sees the game differently. Spatial awareness is different. Um, and also, but, but so, and those things are always, you, know, you can find those guys. But I think the thing that separates Manu, I think is what you said, is the timing. He seemed to know, you know, when it was really important to try and get that steal, right? You know, those moments right. that were key. Not like early in the first quarter when it wasn't mean as much. Uh, that seems to be the key that he was able to do. And, and perhaps that was just an, an extra bit of focus. We're down by six. It's getting in the fourth quarter. Let's do something. Um, and you mix all that stuff in together. And then there he's got a deflection or he's got a uh, pass. Now, I guess it just really speaks to his IQ, right? That sort of is what the overall arching point we're making. Yeah, no, I mean, just IQ wise, it's it's unparalleled. Um, you know, he he's he sees these things and, and, and makes it happen. Um, he sees it offensively, defensively. He hustles in ways, you know, you, you, you can't really, you're, you're surprised by it, but like, he'll get to a ball and you're just like, how the hell does he get to that? Um, you know, I, I, I don't remember what year it was. It was either, it was when I was in San Antonio, but we're playing Oklahoma city and it's a close game. And Manu, you know, makes a huge play saving the ball from going out of bounds. Um, and throws it off the other guy, gives us another possession, and that possession turned out to be the game-winning possession for us. Um, you know, it's just, just just the stuff he does. And and you know what? That's not going to show up in a stat sheet. That's why it's the guys who are going to look at it and say, he doesn't have Hall of Fame numbers. I was like, no, but he's a Hall of Fame player for what he d- did on the court because not everything shows up that way. And I think that's the kind of important stuff. And just, God, man, he's just such a fun player to watch. Yeah. Now, the, the, the Spurs had that run where they've won uh, five championships. Five? Yeah, five. Yeah. And, uh, and they had the core together for that whole time. And what I find interesting is that, you know, recently the aura has kind of worn off a little bit, right? We've had the whole Kawhi issue. And I started looking around thinking, well, okay, what was the difference? What changed in the, in the organization? Because, you know, Pop was still there and Tony Parker was still there and even Manu was still there. But, you know, you look at it and you got to say to yourself, well, you know, it was Tim Duncan. Right. Tim Duncan retires, goes away. And we start to see these cracks in this sort of this, this dissolution of a, of a notion of what the Spurs were always about. And I'm kind of wondering if, you know, and this is a little bit off topic because we can maybe talk more about Tim Duncan, but what maybe it was Tim Duncan 
And then mixed with Manu and Tony Parker and, and all the other guys. But maybe it was Tim Duncan who was really the, the key catalyst for this, this culture that we talk about in San Antonio. I, I don't think it's a myth. I think it's it's 100 percent right on. I think, you know, um, even Pop has said it many times over, you know, um, I've been to dinners where, with Pop where we toast, you know, to Tim because he knows, you yeah. know, it's, it's because of Tim that this this runs able to start, you know, um, you know, Manu, Manu came and definitely was a big part of it. Tony coming along was a huge part of it, you know, and and helped them add those those four other championships. But, you know, Tim won the first one. You know, with him, David Robinson, Avery Brad, uh, uh, Avery Johnson, Avery Johnson. Sorry, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but it's it's all of those things, you know. Um, but Tim was the rock. He was the guy that set it up, you know, from the very beginning, and and was the guy everybody looked to. You know, there's there's no question. Um, you know, when you when you went to the locker room or whatever. Tim was the guy. He was the quiet voice. He wasn't a vocal leader. He wasn't the kind of guy that scream or da, 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 this or that on the court, but he was just the guy that in the locker room had a presence and a voice about him that led to, you know, kind of that leadership that everybody just sort of fell in line and he allowed pop to coach, you know, um, and, and, and allowed pop to get on him. And, and, you know, that's a huge thing there. And that, that makes a big difference. Um, you know how it is as a coach, you know, players having to let you coach them is, is a big part of it. Um, and that means getting on them sometimes, uh, in a way, you know, that's, that's a bit difficult. Of course, as a coach, you, you got to come back to them and, and, and Hey, look, you know, this is, wasn't personal. We're, we're working together. I still love you and all of that stuff. And I think that was there. And you saw kind of pop and pop had a very difficult time coaching Manu to begin with because, you know, Manu's, going to go off script, you know, Manu's <laughs> going to do Manu things. Um, and, so, well, you know, I, but what does that mean exactly? What, what does it mean to, to drive that he drove pop? Cause I know Tony Parker kind of drove him crazy too in the beginning too. So what about Manu, you know, cause I know they finally got to some equilibrium where they could kind of exist together and then th thrive. So what would you say specifically like, or the things that Manu did on the court that would drive Popovich nuts? I mean, I mean, Manu would take quick shots, you know, um, from time to time, Manu would break, break off out of the offense and, and, and kind of go on his own a little bit from time to time. And, you know, it, 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 it's one of those things like, you know, as, as for pop, I think had to learn when do I need to let Manu go off and, and, and give Manu the, the, the room and the, 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 the ability to go explore and, and he's going to screw up from time to time. But when am I going to let him do that? And when do I need to rein him in? And I think that's a challenge that pop really had trying, trying to figure it out because the thing is, you know, you can't really just keep Manu confined and Manu's not a robot. He's not going to play in a, he'd have a very hard time in, in Jerry Sloan's offense, right? With, with very much mechanical and you're doing this and this cut, this is that Manu wants the ability to improvise, mm -hmm. you know, and, and slip and, and slip on a cutter or, or, or instead of going to the screen, go back door and things like that. And, and you need to be able to let Manu have those things to allow him to kind of create that greatness. And I think it took time for pop to get comfortable with him and Manu to get comfortable with pop so that they kind of found, like you said, that equilibrium, which is coaching in sense, you know, trying to figure out how to best use your guys. Um, I think it took him a while to get there. Once they did, you know, I mean, Manu really shined. I mean, he came into the league right away. And, and, and the thing is, you know, he was an impact player when he came on the court, you know, and, and they, it, it, at once they kind of got there, then Manu, you know, it just works out perfectly, you know, and, and that that's that's where you allow Manu to just be Manu. Yeah. And perhaps the seeds of that um, and, 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 and Pop needing to adjust himself uh, is what we finally when we, as we got the beautiful game later on when they won the title uh, in 2014. Um, it, you know, it, it kind of almost opened up the fact that like, OK, we need to get spacing. We need to have uh, um, the ability to, to do that, to have these our players attack on the catch. Uh, and make their own passes and how they want to and have some, you know, it, it just had a lot, a lot more of a looser structure to what they were doing, even though there, there was a very uh, ordered way they moved around the court ultimately, right? But I think that that's sort of the seeds is what we saw. That was the the the, the, the personification of, of, of Manu's game as a five-man unit, I guess. That, am I saying that right? Am I explaining yeah, that? Yeah, no, you're 100% right. And then just something for – for for players and coaches, you know, from, you know, one, one thought I've always kind of had is like, I'm all fine with guys improvising 
and stuff like that. But for me, you got to know the play first, right? You got to know what we want and, 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 and know what we're running. And then if you want to improvise out of it or you see an opportunity to, to cut that that's not normally there, feel free. But, you know, to be able to improvise means you have to know the script first. Right, right. You know? Yes, and, absolutely. And, and I think that's an important thing. And I think, you know, I, I think that's where they found that together. You know, Manu knew every play. You know, he knew where everybody was supposed to be. He knew not only what he was supposed to do, he knew what all the other four guys were going to do. He had an understanding of what to do if the defense did this or that. And then my, and then it's just, all right, now go create, you know. Um, Manu's a chef, man. Give him, the, give him the, <laughs> the ingredients and stuff, and then he'll just make something happen, and that's kind of what it was. Yeah, and we forget, or maybe we don't forget, but certainly he was the guy when they needed the bucket at the end. They would isolate and let him just go to yeah. work. Uh, just like Kevin Durant does, just like Michael Jordan did. I mean, he had that role, which is sort of why it's an affront when you hear people want to criticize, like looking at the numbers or whatever it is, uh, or even this, this strange notion, or maybe it's not so strange that like, okay, let, let's look at his per 36 then if you want to get to the handle. And then people are like, well, you can't expect that he would actually continue those numbers if he can play more minutes. But if there was anybody who I would think would maintain or even exceed if he got those 36 minutes right. a game, it would be Manu, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, and and think about it this way too. If if Manu was on a team where he was the sole guy, you know, or he was the number one option too, the numbers would be different, um, you know. And and yeah. and I I I I think he'd be he would have been fine. He would have flourished just as well in that in that role. Um, he would have been like James Harden. Yeah, I mean, he he definitely had he had all those skills, you know. Um, and that's the thing, you know, he he kind of muted it in certain areas to 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 help teams and 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 was you know the second and third options but like you said the end of the game when you're in san antonio you wanted the ball in manu's hands because you knew there's all several different things he could shoot he could drive and he can create for others and he can make the right pass so it was one of those things it was a no-brainer for pop you know running a high pick and roll for manu and then you know and if manu got to his left it was over like come on (laughs) you know um it's it's just one of those things i think I think Tom Haberstroh said it on a on, on a podcast. Um, I haven't looked at the numbers, but like he had better numbers than Kobe in, in, in crunch time, in clutch situations or game winning situations. I mean, it's it you can't argue it. I mean, he's he's hit big shots, he's made big plays, great passes and stuff out of it to find guys. It's just it's just Manu, man. You know, it's interesting you brought up Kobe for a second there because Part of me feels like every year that goes by now, Kobe's luster is wearing off a little bit too. I almost feel like, I don't know if you feel that way, but it kind of, maybe it's just me, but it sort of feels like, you know, we're, we're in that trajectory now where, you know, maybe we kind of forget, except for the core uh, Laker fans, uh, how great he was. He's sort of going, you know, moving back into the, into the background. The question is, does that happen to Manu? Is he going to end up fading away and people are just going to forget about talking about him in 10 or 15, 20 years? I think it's just normal, you know. I think as as we get older, I mean, I'm never going to forget Kobe, you know. That this is who I was watching most of, you know, my my college years, you know, when I really was beginning to understand basketball. I was watching a lot of Kobe because I was a Laker fan growing up, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so I have a, a, a fondness for him in that sense, you know. I've it's it died down once I was coaching against him and wanted to kick his ass. Excuse mm-hmm. me, language, but uh, you know the the. Um, that stuff but you know i think it's just something that happens over time you know and and for the the younger kids you know the the thing is the last few years of kobe wasn't that great you know health wise and and things like that and and stuff so it's not like so i can understand why people kind of slowly start to fade away but that's that's the thing and that's and that's also a reason why a guy like jordan's so great you know like uh he's a legend you know and 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 you know heroes you know Heroes get remembered, but legends never die kind of thing. And I, and I think that's – sadly, that's just what's going to happen. As we get older, you know, Coach, we're, we're, yeah. the guys we, 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 we love, we're going to be the old dudes going like, but yeah, back in our day though, you know, Manu was, you know, this or, you know, Kobe could do this and, and things like that. And it's, that's, that's the difference, you know, and, and, and I think it's just a natural progression of, of, of sports fandom. Yeah, I'm, I'm already that guy. Mo, so it's like, I mean, I got to remind people about Michael Finley, um, who 
uh, you know, averaged 25 a game for like eight or nine straight years and just, you know, nobody remembers him anymore. And it's like, that's so sad. So I guess I got my work cut out for me. I got to make sure that these guys don't get forgotten. Uh, I'm, you know, you got me inspired. I'm not sure I was even going to do the Manu video, but you know what? F it. Uh, let's get it out. Uh, I'm going to try and get some stuff undone today in the middle of me doing a, I was going to do an evolution of LeBron in the finals of his offensive game. Uh, which go. I think sounds interesting too, because it's been, a, you know what I mean? It's that when you look at LeBron's yeah, evolution, it's pretty interesting. Um, but I, think, I might have to sneak I think, the, I think uh, we're going to see the next evolution. I think we're going to see a very post heavy LeBron over the next, you know, couple seasons. We have, but it ain't going to be in the finals. Oh, not in the finals. For sure. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the problem. But nonetheless, well, listen, awesome stuff, great information, great stories, with being right there in the front lines with Manu for those years in San Antonio. Uh, Mo, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. No, oh, thank you so much for having me, Coach Nick. You got it. And don't forget, sports fans, at B-Ball Breakdown, we're not a channel, we're a conversation. You in? Are you in, Mo? Always. <laughs>